Brothers and sisters, good morning. It's great to be with you today on this beautiful fall semester. I'm grateful for President Cush's opening remarks. I'm grateful for, to him and Sister Cush for their amazing service. I appreciate the, the prayer offered by Leilan, who's one of my students, by the way. She's amazing. <laughs> I appreciate Claudia's uh, testimony today. I'm particularly grateful for the choir number that was sung. You know, my son attended LDS Business College, and he received his associate degree and his certificate in social media marketing. And one of his, the highlights of his experience here was singing in the choir with Brother Decker. And it was a remarkable experience for him. He also played the organ at the assembly hall. And it was just, just a life-changing decision for my son, Drew. And I'm grateful that he had the opportunity to come and experience what we experience every day. I'm grateful that Debbie, my wife, could be here <laughs> by my side. And I'm grateful we're ushering in the you know, final weeks of the semester. This is week 11. We're starting week 12. It's been a wonderful semester. One of the greatest blessings of my employment at Enzyme College is my association with amazing students and employees and faculty. You come from the far corners of the earth. You bring with you wonderful gifts, cultures, experiences, and most importantly, strong testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and a degree of righteousness that is tangible and reflected in your countenances. As Christmas approaches, I hope each of you have a very Merry Christmas, that you cherish this amazing time and season as we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. How grateful I am for his life, for his birth, his teachings, his example, his gospel, and of his atoning sacrifice and subsequent death and triumphant resurrection. I'm grateful for the manner in which the Savior served. His service was perfect and was done with purpose and genuine love. In the, in the councils of heaven before we came to earth, we were present with the Savior. He knew us, he observed us, and he knew of our potential to achieve exaltation and eternal life. He knew that each of us would be strengthened as we served one another. One of our favorite vacation destinations are the beautiful islands of Hawaii. During one particular Sunday visit, we were privileged to attend one of the Kona Hawaii wards. Kona Hawaii, if you've not been there, is truly heaven on earth and represents the true spirit of aloha. I recall how one older brother of the ward spoke of his dedication in fulfilling his calling to be a temple worker. At the time he was called to serve as a temple worker, the Kona Hawaii Temple had not yet been constructed and not even announced. His service required him to fly from Kona to Honolulu and then take a bus ride to the north shore of Oahu to Laie. Following his service for a few days, he would return back to his home in Kona via commercial airline flight. This particular brother was not wealthy, and he, he and his family had set aside all of their savings and extra funds for him to be able to serve in this manner. He served in this assignment for several years. As, as this brother shared his experience of serving in the temple and bore testimony, he wept with gratitude and humility for the opportunity to be able to serve the Lord. He spoke of the amazing blessings and the tender mercies from the Lord that he and his family received due to his service. We turn to the Savior as the model of selfless service. As the Son of God, during his time on earth, he graciously served those in his midst. Descending from heaven, his mission was to establish the kingdom of God. The radiant impact of his gospel transformed worldly perspectives. He healed the sick, made the lame to walk, granted sight to the blind, and restored hearing to the deaf. Remarkably, he even brought the dead back to life. In the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew, the Savior tells us this concerning the faithful who will be on his right hand at his triumphal return. Then shall the king say unto them, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, 
When saw we thee an unhungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked or clothed thee? Or when saw we thee a sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Even on the eve of his crucifixion, knowing that there were but brief moments left to teach his apostles, the Savior shared the following with them. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. But this shall all men know that ye may, that ye may, uh, that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The love the Savior described is manifested not through heroic deeds, but rather through simple acts of kindness and service. There are myriad ways and circumstances in which we can serve and love uh, one another. May I suggest four ways in which we might do this, and which have been a strong foundation for me in, the, in terms of how I approach my own service. To begin with, charity starts within the confines of our homes. Through our actions and example, let us instill in our family members the value of showing love and kindness to one another. From an early age, <laughs> my mother and father taught me the value of hard work. My parents were deeply in love. This love lasted an earthly lifetime of nearly 60 years. It continues on into the eternities of both have passed on. My mother loved roses, and so my father didn't just plant a few bushes to enjoy, but two full rows along each of our neighbor's front yard fence lines to the north and to the south. And part of the duties that my brother and I had were to weed and to tend to these roses each spring. It was a weekly process, but the results were marvelous. The rose bushes and the hundreds of beautiful blooms were the envy of the neighborhood. My father's affection for my mother didn't stop at the front yard, but extended into the backyard, where he planted lilac trees that lined the neighbor's yards to the south and to the north. They needed constant trimming and loving care, and the aromas in our neighborhood were amazing and wonderful. In addition to caring for flowers, we also had a large garden. We had a large cherry tree, a large yard that needed weekly trimming and mowing and watering. And our, lar our yard was always immaculate. We did this without a sprinkler system, by the way, which was amazing. It was a true expression of the love my father had for my mother and for us boys. It wasn't the physical work that was most important, however. It was the spiritual and gospel-centered home that my parents created for our small family. It was filled with daily scripture study and prayer and weekly family home evening, church attendance, church callings, home and visiting teaching duties, it was the regular, simple, essential activities that, my, that we participated in that built my testimony, strengthened my faith, and kept us holding firm to the iron rod. My parents loved the Lord with all their strength and in turn loved one another and throughout their lives and loved their two boys. They created an environment that allowed and encouraged us not only to serve one another, but to serve those in our neighborhood and our extended family. A second place where we have an ample opportunity to serve is in the church. Within our wards and branches, the desire to serve others should consistently shape our interactions and behaviors. By extending kindness, offering words of support and encouragement, and being attuned to each other's needs, we foster a sense of loving unity among ward members. Both adults and youth in the ward can come together through meaningful service, collectively working to bless the lives of others. While serving in our Bay Area, California ward several years ago, during a particular ward council, our ward Relief Society president identified a sister that was, in, that was in need of extensive loving service. This particular sister lived alone, was in her late 60s, and relied on her employment as her sole means of support. She had some challenging health issues that led to her involvement in a car accident which resulted in her driver's license being revoked. She also had very poor vision. She became very reliant on the service of others to help her, and she had little to no family support. The full power of an effective service-ready ward council was activated to assist her. A Loving Relief Society president created a sign-up sheet to invite sisters to take Ruth to and from work each day. The primary president 
employed the primary children to create gratitude cards for Ruth that contained beautiful artwork and verses of love uh, that unified and helped her to feel special. The young men president activated the young men to assist with yard work and raking of leaves as Ruth was not able to afford a yard care service. The young women planned and held a dinner in which they recognized and spotlighted Ruth and other seniors to celebrate their amazing life experiences, her, their amazing life experiences. And the elders quorum president ensured that ministering brothers visited Ruth often to share uplifting messages and give priesthood blessings. Although a little bit active previously, the service Ruth received uh, in abundance softened her heart. She began to attend church more regularly and as she partook of the sacrament each week, it provided her with the added strength she needed to make attending easier and long-lasting. As a result, she was motivated to pay tithing, and she became eligible again to receive a current temple recommend. As these things occurred, the Lord's blessings and tender mercies were poured out more abundantly than ever. She knew that she was not forgotten and that the Lord remembers and loves each of his children. Since the beginning... God has orchestrated his work and facilitated service through councils. In our efforts with Ruth, our ward council applied the principles taught by President M. Russell Ballard. It is a divine pattern and includes know your purpose, seek the Lord's will, not your own, ensure that every voice is heard, seek women's perspectives, listen to learn, seek consensus through revelation, not compromise. President Ballard said, those who learn to counsel effectively in their stakes, wards and families, following the divine pattern Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ showed us, will always end up with a better result, always end up with a better answer, will always end up with a better spirit. A third area where we can serve is in our communities. In a genuine demonstration of our care and affection, we can extend a helping hand to those in need. Numerous avenues for service exist as expressions of our love and concern. In my definition of community, it isn't just the local community in which we live, but the global community of fellow Latter-day Saints. I recently have felt more of an urgent need to serve others and apply my knowledge and experience in strategy, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help others realize the dream of launching their own business and become self-reliant including their ability to serve their families, their communities, and fellow church members. I recently joined a nonprofit board that focuses on funding micro-businesses in Ghana for young entrepreneurs who have a great business idea but lack the funds to be able to activate them and get them started. In a desire to be self-sufficient and provide for their families and serve in the church, they prepare a business plan that outlines the opportunity, how the business will be profitable, and how the funds will be used to launch and grow the business. As part of our efforts, we line up sponsors who hear the business ideas pitched in a Shark Tank-like manner and award small financial grants to individuals allowing them to launch their business. So you may, you may be asking what types of businesses have been re recipients of these small but very needed funds. Abigail boosted her graphics business by using a grant for a Canon printer attracting customers and doubling profits. Josephine, a seamstress, tripled de dre her dress production, increased revenue by $400 a month, raised profit margins from 9% to 67% through a grant that helped purchase sewing machines and allowed her expand to expand her physical business and hire additional workers. Theophilus was able to begin managing a catfish farm and has achieved a remarkable 92% return on investment. Priscilla's business venture provides charcoals to 40 customers, where eight out of 10 urban households rely on it. She has recently become a distributor to other small charcoal business suppliers and her business is booming. Why are these stories so important? Because they speak to the ability to use our education, talents and skills that our Heavenly Father has blessed us with to directly bless the lives and offer service to others. As we serve one another and help each other, lives, families, and communities are transformed, and the restored gospel is extended to generations. You know another remarkable fact? Students at Enzyme College, in our Business 295 Introduction to Business Strategy course, following the example 
of the Savior's service assisted several of these entrepreneurs, helping them to prepare their business idea proposals, providing them the best possible opportunity to qualify for the desperately needed funds. All four, all four entrepreneurs are active members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and serve in their respective wards where they bless the lives of one another. A final way to serve Heavenly Father's children is by embracing missionary endeavors that go beyond traditional full-time missions, incorporating our roles as friends and neighbors. The sustained growth of the church doesn't solely rely on door-to-door -door outreach. Instead, it flourishes when both members and missionaries motivated by the love of our Heavenly Father and the Savior, identify needs and respond with heartfelt acts of charitable service. In every instance at our service, it is crucial to attune ourselves to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. The gentle, quiet guidance will reveal to us those in need and illuminate the ways in which we can extend our assistance. President Thomas S. Monson has counseled, the needs of others are ever-present, and each of us can do something to help someone. Unless we lose ourselves in service to others, there is little purpose to our own lives. In an effort to minimize costs, provide an environment with few distractions, and ensure safer living conditions, the Sacramento, California mission president, in coordination with stake presidents and bishops, was inspired to invite families that met certain housing requirements to consider housing a pair of missionaries. Debbie and I had never considered this kind of service opportunity before. But as we prayed about it, we felt a strong impression that we should open our home to the missionaries. During our eight years while living in Tracy, California, for about two of those years, we had the privilege of housing or ha having two full-time elders live with us. Those years were truly a blessing. And we met and loved each and every full-time servant, which came from all four corners of the earth. Never did we think we would have one Elder Caicis join us from the small South Pacific island of Kiribati, a place that President Nelson announced in 2020 would be blessed to have a house of the Lord. Elder Caicis is one of the most happy, most content, dedicated disciples of Jesus Christ that we ever did meet. He grew up in a fishing village catching skip jack tuna, which was part of his daily diet with rice. And for Christmas, we gave him a rice cooker, and his world completely changed. He'd never even before <laughs> seen a rice cooker. <laughs> he was amazed at how fast his rice could be prepared for and ready to, to, for his meal to accompany his tuna. In fact, one day my wife, was he was there at the house, and he observed that he, was, he climbed a 30-foot light pole outside of our house. He was really fit and a uh, pretty strong uh, elder. After Elder Caicis returned to his island, he, he became married and later welcomed a healthy son to the family. We have stayed clo in close contact with him even though communications are challenging. A few years ago, we received devastating news that his wife was in the hospital with non-COVID related respiratory complications and learned that she had passed away. And that Elder Caicis is now a single father to his four-year-old son. Our family wept for his great loss. But instead of condemning God or becoming bitter, the ever optimistic Elder Caicis has grown firmer in his testimony of the Savior and in his hope for a future reunion with his beloved wife. In his words to our family, he reflected how the Savior had overcome many hardships and that if the Savior was able to endure them and be faithful to the very end, so could he. When we emulate the Savior's model of service, we become enveloped or enveloped, sorry, in his love and compassion. His late radiates upon us, and we in turn can share the brightness with others. How grateful we were for the opportunity to serve the full-time missionaries in this manner and that we acted on the promptings we received. It truly blessed our family. Over the course of my three years at Ensign College, students frequently ask about my career path and how I've been able to remain steadfast in the gospel, still be successful, and thrive in the business world. I've found as, I, as I've put the Lord first and his work ahead of everything else, that opportunities naturally open up through the service and the promptings of others. I have relied constantly on major sources of light in my life. They have come in a variety of ways and all come from the ultimate source of light, the Savior, Jesus Christ. In, 20, in April 2017, General 
conference, Elder Rasban speaking on the topic, Let the Holy Spirit Guide You, and receiving and acting on personal revelation taught us a nice pattern of receiving and following promptings. Quote, Each week as we partake of the Holy Sacrament, we make a covenant to always remember him, the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice. When we keep this sacred covenant, the promise is given that we may always have his spirit to be with us. Close quote. Elder Rasban asks, quote, how do we do that? And then outlines four steps to do so. First, we must strive to live worthy of the spirit. Second, we must be willing to receive the spirit. Third, we must recognize the spirit when it comes. And fourth, we must act on the first prompting. He also says that we must be confident in the first promptings. Remember the words of Nephi. I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Nevertheless, he said, I went forth. And likewise, we too should trust our initial promptings. It is common to engage in rationalization, questioning whether a spiritual impression truly guides us or if it's merely our own thoughts. Yet we, when we succumb to second guessing, even third guessing, our feelings, and we've all been there, we, we risk dismissing the spirit and casting doubt on divine counsel. The prophet Joseph taught that if you will listen to the first promptings, you will get it right nine times out of ten. Following on acting on promptings invites opportunities to serve more frequently and with a divine purpose. Thomas S. Monson, the 16th president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was a dedicated advocate for selfless service to others. His approach to service was deeply rooted in compassion, empathy, and a genuine desire to alleviate the burdens of those around him. President Monson often emphasized the importance of reaching out to individuals in need, whether they were struggling with physical, emotional, or spiritual challenges. His life was a testament to the belief that true happiness and fulfillment come from serving and lifting others. One of President Monson's key teachings was the idea that whenever we do for others, what they cannot do for themselves, we are truly serving the master. This philosophy underscored his commitment to hands-on practical acts of service and kindness. He inspired countless individuals to look beyond their own concerns and actively seek opportunities to make a positive impact to the lives of those less fortunate. President Monson's legacy is one of, the, one of compassion, compassionate leadership, and his approach to service continues to inspire individuals worldwide to embrace a life dedicated to helping and serving others. My dear brothers and sisters, during my few years at Ensign College, I observed kind acts, kind acts of service rendered on a daily basis. There's a strong culture here at, of Christ-like service that permeates the college across the entire campus. I see it in the classroom, the hallways, in meetings, during mealtimes, at devotionals, in the library, at the outpost, in the carriage house, on the front runner, inside of the elevator, and in quiet one-on-one -on -one conversations that you have with each other outside of public view. Your service is remarkable, and the Savior smiles down upon our college. Continue to give Christ-like service and care for each other. The Spirit will lead you. In conclusion, as we reflect on the principle of extending the blessings of the gospel through Christ-like service, let us view it as a calling for a lifetime. May our hearts be stirred with the genuine love that Christ exemplified, prompting us to consciously and continually prioritize acts of kindness and compassion. In the tapestry of our lives, may the thread of service weave a pattern of love, unity, and discipleship. As we leave today, may our commitment to emulate the Savior in our actions be unwavering, radiating the light of the gospel to all. I testify that Jesus is the Christ and our Savior and Redeemer. I pray that we may more openly talk of him and share his light with those around us. As we pray for this desire and act upon the promptings we receive, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we will more easily be guided to direct our attention to those who are in truly need of our service. Let us embark on this journey of service with faith, knowing that as we extend our hands to lift others, we are acting in the Savior's way, is my prayer, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.